Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Everybody doing okay? Yes. All right. Well, that was just, that was wonderful. That was a great way to get things kicked off. Young lady, you have a beautiful voice. Absolutely beautiful. So, yes, give her another round of applause. I sang all the way through, uh, through college, and uh, boy, do I, I miss it. And when I hear someone like you just uh, with, with such an amazing voice, it makes me miss it even more. So, again, thank you. Dr. Outler, Kendra, thank you so much for bringing me here to this beautiful campus. Even on a gloomy day, you can't miss the beauty of Agnes Scott as you're walking from one building to the next. You all are truly blessed to have the opportunity to be educated here, and I'm blessed to be here to get to speak with you today. Uh, President Zach, thank you so much for your kindness. And uh, again, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, I'm glad that Kendra didn't say too much because usually my mother sends my bio ahead of time and they spend more time reading my bio than, uh, than us actually having a conversation. But uh, I do want you all to know that I'm a father. I've got 14-year-old and 13-year-old boys and a nine-year-old little girl. And more than anything else you can read on my bio, they inform what I do, they inspire what I do. Uh, they're the reason that I'm here today, and they're the reason why I think it's so important that we all use our unique positions to advocate for a, for a better world, for a better tomorrow. I also, it's interesting, we had conversations about um, here in Georgia and, uh, and growing up in different places, and folks often call the Surgeon General the nation's doctor, but I think what's unique about me is that I represent the nation's patients. There's hardly a disease you can mention that my family hasn't been afflicted by. I had a grandfather who died from complications of lung cancer, another grandfather who died early because of a stroke. Uh, my wife is actually battling metast metastatic melanoma right now and is in during, uh, undergoing treatments. Uh, we have substance use disorder in my family, and I've got an uncle who's in a nursing home because of alcoholism. And so I really try to bring that to the table. And, and I say that to you all, particularly as students, because a lot of times as we get older, we tend to push those things down. We don't think it's appropriate to talk about those things professionally. It's not appropriate to bring our personal lives to work. But uh, God puts you in these positions for a reason. And we get better policy when people bring a little bit of themselves to the conversation, when they help folks understand that it's different being from Chattanooga, Tennessee than being from Boston, Massachusetts. It's different when, you, when your family immigrated from Somalia versus if you live in Berkeley, California. And so don't ever be ashamed to bring a little bit of yourself, a little bit of your family, a little bit of your background to the table because it's what got me here today. There's thousands of people out there who are as qualified as me to be Surgeon General. Uh, so no matter how long the bio gets, that's not why I think I'm qualified to be Surgeon General. It's because I really try to represent each and every one of you all each and every day throughout my experiences. Uh, Kendra mentioned Black History Month, and I'm privileged to be here during Black History Month as the fourth African-American Surgeon General. You know what's interesting is that I was visiting with my godson this past weekend, and he said, Uncle Jerome, we were uh, going over Black History Month in school, and they were talking about you. Did you know your black history? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know that I want to be referred to as history, but uh, it, it is quite an honor. In almost 150 years, there have been only 20 United States Surgeons General confirmed. I'm the 20th. There have been twice as many presidents if there have been United States Surgeons General. So again, it's a blessing to be in this role. And what's fascinating is that four out of the last six Surgeons General were African-American. So we've made quite a bit of progress. I'm honored to play just a small part, my part in the major progress we've made, not only in the field of medicine, but as a country. And not too far from this very spot here in Atlanta, resides one of my predecessors that some of you all know, Dr. David Satcher. If you're not familiar with his story, I urge you to look him up because he truly is African-American history. He is the only person 
in, in the entire history of our country to ever serve as CDC director, assistant secretary for health, and United States Surgeon General, in addition to being the president of various medical institutions, he's a bad man. He's a bad man and he's right down the street from you all and he's still teaching. And so I encourage you all to look him up and to get to know him if you can. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. He's a great friend and a great mentor of mine. Here at Agnes Scott College, the, message, uh, the mission, as, uh, as those of you who go here know, is to educate women to think deeply, to live honorably, and to engage the intellectual and social challenges of our times. And uh, I tell you, we've got some intellectual and social challenges going on right now. This is particularly the case for the opioid epidemic, and I hope to spark a rich discussion about how you can be part of the solution. I also want to mention that this Friday, you all will be celebrating Founders Day. And I want to thank everyone for allowing me to kick off the week leading to your 130th anniversary celebration. So congratulations, Agnes Scott. <laughs> now, I've given a lot of these talks, and uh, I finished several realizing that folks don't even know what a Surgeon General is or does. So I'll start off by just uh, leveling the playing field and debunking a few myths. Number one, I'm not the Attorney General. <laughs> I've been introduced as the Attorney General almost as much as I've been introduced as the Surgeon General, but uh, I am not the Attorney General. I don't want to be the Attorney General. He is getting way too much press for, for my liking at this point in time. I don't want to be in that situation. Don't look anything like him. <laughs> and so, not the Attorney General. Second, to the untrained eye, I may appear to be an airline pilot. But I'm not a pilot, and you don't want me anywhere near the cockpit of the plane, especially on a day like today. The turbulence we had coming in this morning was, uh, was no joke. So uh, you don't want me uh, in, in the front of the plane. On the back of the plane, I've actually been asked for peanuts and, uh, <laughs> and headphones before. And you know, like a good public servant, I usually just get them, because it's easier than to try to explain to them that I'm the Surgeon General of the United States. Third, I'm neither a surgeon nor a general. And actually, many people think that the Surgeon General has to be a surgeon or is a general. I'm actually an anesthesiologist, so I work with surgeons quite a bit, and that's how Dr. Outler and I know each other. And I'm a Vice Admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, uh, an elite group of 6,500 full-time, highly qualified health professionals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, engineers, environmental health officers, and I am very proud to lead them as we protect and promote the health and safety of our country, responding to wildfires, to hurricanes, uh, the only uniform service providing clinical care on the ground during the Ebola outbreak in Africa. And so a very important role to be a Vice Admiral in the United States Public Health Commission Corps. And Lieutenant Miller is here. She's actually an Agnes Scott alum and is a member of the Commission Corps. So when you see us walking around, in these uniforms around Atlanta. Many of our folks work at CDC. Um, know that those are folks out there who are working to keep you safe. Uh, but the most visible role of the Surgeon General is to communicate the science around health to the American people. And in that role, I'm focused on promoting health, preventing disease, and leading with the science. And during my time, there are three main areas that I'm focused on. Number one is addressing substance misuse. That includes uh, alcohol misuse, and we're on a college campus, so it's worth mentioning, we have an alcohol problem in this country. We're seeing more and more people who are consuming at rates that are way above just normal use. Binge drinking is, is, uh, is, is far and beyond what it should be, and that goes through adulthood. We still have um, smoking rates that are too high in this country, and many of you all may be aware that I released an e-cigarette advisory helping folks understand that e-cigarettes contain high levels of nicotine um, and other substances that can be harmful to you and they're really affecting our learning environment in our country. I was talking with five superintendents just last week in Arizona and they said they're literally having to suspend and expel kids because they're so addicted to e-cigarettes that they can't make it through the school day without, uh, without vaping, without hitting their jewel and, uh, and it's disrupting the learning environment. Uh, 
also leaning into opioid misuse, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But number two is improving the health of communities by making the connection between investments in health and resulting economic prosperity, making the case that communities that are healthier are going to generate more jobs, higher wages, going to see less workplace accidents. And why is that important? Well, it's important because number one issue people vote on, black or white, Democrat or Republican, um, rural or urban, it's not health. It's jobs in the economy. And so we have to speak to people in a way that resonates with their priorities. As a matter of fact, how many of you all in here are interested in health or going into health? So majority of the room. I contend that you all don't even prioritize health in your everyday life. How many times <laughs> have you all not eaten right or not eaten at all, not gotten enough sleep, not worked out for the sake of your job? All the time. All the time. And so it's important that we recognize that. Because when we're trying to change other people's minds, we've got to realize that just as we don't prioritize health, we can't just stand in front of other people and say, you need to prioritize health in your everyday life. We need to help them understand that living a healthier life will help them achieve the other goals that are on their priority list. And we also have to help them figure out how to incorporate healthy lifestyles into their busy lives. The third thing I'm focusing on is raising awareness of the link between our nation's health and its safety and national security. Because number one issue people vote on is jobs in the economy. Number two issue people vote on, it's safety and security. Over and over and over again. And when you hear people running for office, you'll hear they run on jobs. They're going to run on keeping your community safe. Over and over again. And we know, we know, the statistics show us that healthier communities have less crime. So it's important if you care about crime in your community that you care about the health and the opportunities for health that exist in your communities. And here are the shocking statistics for you. 70% of 18 to 25 year olds in our country, seven out of 10 are ineligible for military service because they can't pass the physical, can't meet the educational requirements or have a criminal background record. So our nation's poor health isn't just a matter of chronic disease 20 or 30 years down the road. We are literally a less safe country right now because we're an unhealthy country. And so as Surgeon General, again, I'm trying to help folks understand that if we want to achieve our goals of a safer, more prosperous United States, then we have to focus on healthier communities. And my guiding principle as I march through my priorities is better health through better partnerships. Because when the solutions are complex, and especially if they're controversial, and hopefully we'll get into some of this in the conversation, but a lot of these discussions are controversial in our country, we need partnerships and we need collaboration. We can only achieve our collective goals together, and students, professors, folks from the community can play an important role and must be at the table when we're discussing these important community health issues. Now I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into the opioid epidemic and spend most of my time talking about that because it's a prime example of the challenges that we face in this country, and it's also a great opportunity. And what do I mean when I say it's a great opportunity? Well, uh, five years ago, if I'd gone to any community in America and said, I want to talk to your, your local CEO of your largest company, I want to talk to your sheriff, I want to talk to, uh, uh, to your local faith-based leader, I want to talk to your, your high school superintendent, I want to talk to all these different community leaders about a health issue, doesn't matter which health issue you picked, most of them wouldn't have shown up. But now everyone will show up to talk about the opioid epidemic. So we have a tremendous opportunity here. And uh, again, we're going to talk mostly about the opioid epidemic as we go on. But I want you to not just think about opioids, because the opioid epidemic isn't the problem so much as it is the symptom. It's the symptom of a lack of health and wellness in our communities. And if we can think through how to address the opioid epidemic, and even more so how to prevent the next epidemic from occurring, then this tragedy would not have been a total waste of lives, of resources, of effort, and of energy. Now today in America, there's an estimated 2.1 million people struggling with an opioid use disorder. P 
people with opioid use disorder, they're our friends, our neighbors, our family. We're going to be honest about it, statistically speaking, even some of us in this room today. And like many Americans, for me, the opioid crisis isn't just pressing, it's personal. My baby brother, Philip, is currently serving a 10-year prison sentence for stealing $200 to support his addiction. And, uh, you know, I share that for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, it costs about $150 to $200 a day to incarcerate someone times 10 years means even if he serves half of his sentence, all of you all, as taxpayers, are going to pay upwards of a half a million dollars to incarcerate him versus $5,000 for a diversion program so that he could be rehabilitated versus $500 to get him mental health treatment for his anxiety and depression in the first place versus $50 for an after-school program that could have built resilience and prevented him from ever trying substances in the first place. So I think it's important that we try to rethink the way that we look at substance misuse. Philip suffered from untreated mental illness. He turned to drugs to self-medicate. And uh, you know, I still remember taking my, my two boys into prison to see him, and uh, I'll tell you, I talked about being the nation's patient earlier. There's not a more painful and memorable moment in your life than taking your, your uh, then 12 and 13 year old boys into a state prison and watching them essentially get strip searched so that they can go and visit their, uh, their uncle. Going through those, those, those uh, cages, past the barbed wire, through the thick, thick uh, concrete walls, and uh, having to explain to your, to your sons what, what the process is and what to expect as they're going in. But I also share my family's struggle to illustrate that addiction can happen to anyone, even the brother of the United States Surgeon General. We like to blame addiction on all sorts of things, bad upbringing, um, you know, not enough supervision on the part of the parents. Well, guess what? My parents managed to raise a Surgeon General of the United States, so I think they did something right, right? But addiction can happen to anyone. And I also share my story because I hope it gives others the courage to share theirs so that together we can fight stigma. I truly believe as Surgeon General that stigma is one of our biggest killers. And unless we can help individuals and families feel more comfortable seeking help, we will not be able to reach those who need it the most. Now, I've also been on the other side of the opioid epidemic professionally as State Health Commissioner of Indiana, I oversaw the response to the largest ever outbreak of HIV related to injection drug, drug use in the history of the United States. In order to curb the opioid epidemic and result in HIV outbreak that was impacting rural Scott County, Indiana, a town of 4,000 people that now has over 200 cases of HIV, an incidence rate of HIV at its peak that then CDC Director Tom Frieden said was higher than anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa. You all think about that. That's a rural community in Middle America with a higher HIV incidence rate than anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa related to the opioid epidemic. But in order to solve that crisis, I had to form strategic partnerships with local stakeholders. And I get invited all over the world to talk about this HIV outbreak and get invited by medical folks. And they ask, who did you, who did you partner with? Who did you call to solve this outbreak? And I'm a physician, I'm a public health expert, so people usually think I'm going to say, well, the CDC. They think I'm going to say, well, the local school of medicine. I think I'm going to say, well, the National Institutes of Health, or someone along those lines. And the fact is, all those groups of people helped me, but the first group of people I called were the local sheriff, the local business leaders, and the local faith-based leaders. And while this may seem surprising to some of you, I knew that I had to work with these trusted community leaders to ensure community buy-in. The problem is public health professionals, like myself, like some of you in this room, we often like to stand in front of our podiums and tell the community how they need to solve their problems without actually asking the community what their concerns are, what their priorities are. 
And I didn't want to make that mistake in Scott County, Indiana. So I sat down with the sheriff. Probably shouldn't say this as Surgeon General, but I went down and had a beer with the sheriff. <laughs> and I asked him, what are you concerned about? And he was concerned about his officers getting stuck by syringes when they were arresting people. So I shared with him that syringe service programs actually have been proven to lower needle stick injuries to law enforcement officers by 60%. I then went to the church and sat down with the local pastors and learned they were worried about enabling drug use. How can we get behind something that we feel is morally wrong? And I shared with them that syringe service programs actually provide connections to care and pathways to recovery and that they, they could be part of a step to people getting back on the right path. I shared with them that I talked to other faith-based leaders who had seen syringe service programs operated well and actually participated sometimes in those syringe service programs so that folks when they came in could also get a hot meal, could also get a connection to other services that they had available. And the fact is, together, we were able to determine an evidence-based approach to address all of our concerns and provide the community with a solution to overcome their HIV outbreak. But it never would have happened if I'd stayed in the big city, if I hadn't driven down to them, if I'd written a journal article simply telling them what they needed to do, if I'd gone on TV and said, they're a bunch of backwoods yokels who won't do what the science says that they should do, and that's why they have this HIV outbreak. The fact is, that's what a lot of my academic colleagues actually did. That's exactly what they did. And I share this story because I hope that you all are a little bit more compassionate or a little bit more understanding as you progress throughout your careers. Now let's discuss current trends because just as in Scott County, this national crisis has spanned many different phases, but the reality is it started with good intentions. 20 years ago, we were facing an epidemic of undertreated pain. That's a reality. Too many folks were going without proper management of their pain. And so they declared that pain was the fifth vital sign. And we were taught to prescribe opioids as a safe and non-addictive way to treat pain. Well, we found out that that was wrong. And over the years, our knowledge of pain management has evolved and prescribers have begun to correct their dispensing patterns. I'm happy to say that in the last five years, physicians have decreased opioid prescriptions by 22% nationwide. There's a but there, though. Even though we've made strides with opioid prescribing, we've unfortunately seen an increase in heroin-related morbidity and mortality, and most recently, a dramatic spike in overdose deaths from illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Why is that? Because again, we dealt with the symptom and not the root problem. We decreased opioid prescribing, but we didn't deal with the fact that people had untreated pain. 62% of people who misuse opioids say they're misusing them to treat chronic pain. So while we should congratulate ourselves from decreasing opioid, for decreasing opioid prescribing because 80% of people who inject heroin say they got started with a prescription opioid, we're not ultimately going to solve this problem unless we move upstream and also fill in the blanks with better pain management. Now, I mentioned overdoses. In November, the CDC reported that drug overdoses set another annual record in 2017 with just over 70,000 lives taken. Over 1,500 drug-related deaths occurred in Georgia in 2017, above the national average. The truth is there's a person dying of an opioid overdose every 11 minutes. And here's another tidbit that I want you all to leave here with. Over half of those individuals died in a home environment. They're not dying in hospitals. They're not dying in back alleys. They're dying in garages. They're dying in bedrooms. They're dying in bathrooms. And there's the opportunity to save those lives. The other reality is that the opioid epidemic has been seeping into communities of color where heroin overdose death rates have more than doubled among African Americans. And unfortunately, for far too long, this has gone unrecognized by the media. 
From 2010 to 2014, rates of heroin overdose have increased by 213% for African Americans. And this in the invisibility of African Americans, of Native Americans, of Hispanics and Latinos, it reflects a cultural divide and a lack of attention to the plight of so many in our country. I'm sometimes asked my feelings about past disregard for communities of color. because There's a lot of anger out there. The question I get is, how come you all are paying attention to it now that white people are dying? I get asked that question all the time. And you know, I think it's important that number one, we acknowledge the wrongs that have happened in the past. We have to acknowledge that they occurred. I think it's important that number two, we apologize to communities who've been ignored for far too long. But I also think it's important that we learn from the past, but we look towards the future. That we don't get so caught up being angry that we don't recognize the opportunity that exists. Because for so many of us, we've been trying for all of our lives getting folks to pay attention to substance use disorder. Now folks are paying attention. So we can't then go and say, well, why are you all paying attention to it now? Versus grasping the opportunity that presents itself and fighting to make sure the remedies are equitably applied across all communities. And so that's what I'm focused on. I'm focused on making sure that now that folks are paying attention to what's going on, that we shine a light on all communities and that we make sure the resources get to all communities so that everyone can be lifted up from this opioid epidemic. And how can we all do our part to create a better tomorrow? Well, any of you all remember this guy called C. Everett Coop? I know it's a young crowd here, but uh, most <laughs> folks uh, still do remember him. He was a Surgeon General in the 1980s, probably the most famous Surgeon General of, uh, of our lifetimes. And uh, he sent a pamphlet called Understanding AIDS to every household in America, dealing with ways that individuals could get involved to stop the HIV epidemic that was going on at that time. In my opinion, the opioid crisis calls for a similar approach. So I took a 21st century slant and issued a digital postcard to educate all Americans about the opioid crisis. It's at SurgeonGeneral.gov. You can go to my website. You can download this, you can share it, because C. Everett Coop literally sent an envelope out to every household in the country. Uh, number one, most people don't open their mail anymore. And number two, uh, I don't have enough money to send an envelope out to everyone across America. So I'm relying on each and every one of you to send this out digitally. It's how we're going to spread it. But it provides the public with tangible actions they can take to raise awareness, prevent addiction, and stop overdose deaths. And I'm going to quickly walk everyone through the five simple steps that everyone in this room can take to combat the epidemic. And the first step is talk about it. And remember I told you that this is a paradigm for how you can deal with so many other diseases out there? Pick any disease you want, whether it's cancer, whether it's cardiovascular disease in February is heart month, uh, whether it's melanoma. The first step is talking about it. So in regards to opioids, we need to have a discussion about opioids being addictive and dangerous, particularly a problem on college campuses. Far too many folks on college campuses are misusing drugs of all kinds, whether they're stimulants or opioids, because they think that because they come in a, in a bottle that has Dr. So-and-so written on it, that they're safe. But it, uh, opioids can be terribly addictive and terribly dangerous. In September of 2018, I released Facing Addiction in America, the Surgeon General Spotlight on Opioids. It's a 40-page report that list, uh, that shines a light on the latest data and list uh, the science behind opioid misuse. So I encourage you to look at that on surgeongeneral.gov also. Number two, be safe. Only take opioid medications as prescribed. And that's a big problem too. Uh, too many folks out there want to hoard opioids, think it's okay to share opioids. Oh, you got a headache? I got an extra Percocet from when I got my wisdom teeth pulled. No, that, that's for far too many folks, the first step to a lifetime of addiction. Always store your medications in a secure place and dispose of unused medications properly. Because again, 80% of heroin users got started with a prescription opioid. We like to think of drug dealers as these bad people out there. You know who the first drug dealers are for the majority of uh, folks with substance use disorder? 
It's not some shady guy in a back alley. It's your grandmother. It's your aunt. It's your uncle. It's you. It's anyone who has unused opioids who they leave out and someone comes in, takes a couple pills out of that bottle in your medicine cabinet when they're using your bathroom. And the next thing you know, they're in the hands of someone like my brother and they're the first step on the pathway to addiction. Now the DeKalb County Board of Health is a great place to learn more about dispensing medication. They're disposing of medication that's been dispensed. Last year the Board of Health teamed up with the DeKalb County Police Department for the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency's 15th Na National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. But if you have any unused medications in your house, on your person, please secure them and get rid of them when you're done with them. The third step, understand pain. And I mentioned this crisis of, of undertreated pain that led to the opioid epidemic. We need to understand that treatments other than opioids are not only effective, but in many cases they're better at managing pain and have less risk for long-term harm. So if you're in pain yourself, talk with your healthcare provider about an individualized plan that is right for your pain. Heard way too many stories of high schoolers, of people in college having minor sports injuries and getting prescribed Percocet or Vicodin and finding out that their brain is wired such that, hey, I like that. Try a few more, try a few more, and the next thing you know, you're hooked. There are many other modalities that are, like I said, as good or better than opioids, but it's up to you to ask that. For the young people, when your parents are going into the hospital, make sure you're having a conversation about, about their pain management when they're in the hospital. Do they really need opioids? If they do, do they really need to go home with 60 Vicodin? Or can we get by with just 10 or 15? Can we add Tylenol or ibuprofen or other modalities? Not even med medical modalities, acupuncture, um, uh, music therapy, uh, meditation. All of these are evidence-based ways to help control your pain and lessen your need for dangerous opioids. Fourth, no addiction. It's important that we understand addiction as a chronic disease that changes the brain and alters decision making. So in many cases, folks will say that people with addiction make bad choices. No mistake about it. My brother's made some bad choices along the way. He made a bad choice when he chose to take that first pill. You know, but unfortunately, the fifth pill, the tenth pill, the fifteenth pill, we can show you scientifically that the brain changes. And literally, folks no longer have the ability to reason beyond getting that next fix, getting that next high. Addiction changes the brain. It's a disease. But as with any other disease, we know that there are treatments available that are effective. With the right treatments and supports, people do recover, and there is hope. And it's important that we let folks know that. And then lastly, be prepared. As I mentioned, Majority of opi opioid overdoses that happen in a home environment, so having naloxone, an opioid overdose reversing drug, could mean saving a life. Many of you may have heard this in April of last year. I issued the first Surgeon General's advisory in more than 10 years, highlighting the importance of naloxone access as a way to curb opioid morbidity and mortality. And while our police officers and firefighters have made great strides to ensure that their personnel carry naloxone, we're not going to solve this problem unless more of us are willing to carry naloxone. How many of you all know CPR? All right, how many of you all carry naloxone on you? So, statistically speaking, right now, it is just as likely, if not more likely, that someone comes in that room right now and says there's someone overdosing in the bathroom as there is that someone says someone's having a heart attack in that bathroom. So it's important that we all understand, and here in Georgia, you can carry naloxone. There are two different versions that are available over the counter. One is an injectable form called Evzio, and it talks to you. And literally, that's how easy it is to save a life. The other version is like Flonase. It's an intranasal version. Just put it in the nose and push. That's how easy, again, it is to save a life. Any of you can do it. It's actually easier than CPR. Yes? If you don't currently take opioids, how is it that you get naloxone? Like, say you want to get naloxone to add to your first aid kit, but 
you don't get opioids and you need a prescription, if you, if you don't confirm a prescription for opioids and you need a prescription for naloxone, how, how do you convince your doctor that you need naloxone but you don't actually take opioids, you're just getting it? No, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And so there are nonprofit groups that hand out free naloxone. There are um, health depart the health department hands out free naloxone. But in Georgia, as in all other states, you can also get naloxone as a third party. You can go into a pharmacy by standing order and say, I want to get some naloxone. And you don't have to give them any reason whatsoever. You can get it by standing order to say, I want to have naloxone to be prepared in case someone around me has an opioid overdose. And it, just to be honest with you, if you don't have insurance, then it will cost you. Um, but if you go into a health department or to a nonprofit, then they will give you naloxone for free. But if you have insurance, um, you can go into any pharmacy and ask for naloxone and get it through a standing order. So a couple different ways to be able to carry it. Also, in case you didn't know this, President Zach, uh, each of the uh, manufacturers has said that if you reach out to them, they will make naloxone available free to uh, colleges, to universities, and to high schools because they want folks to, uh, to carry this. I was actually talking to a news commentator the other day whose son overdosed and died in college. He was actually thinking he was getting a stimulant because unfortunately many folks out there are taking stimulants to help them study and he got a counterfeit, counterfeit stimulant that had fentanyl in it and overdosed and died. And so again, uh, very important even on college campuses that we understand the risk that come with taking medications that haven't been prescribed for you and that we're prepared to respond to an opioid overdose because anyone, any one of you can save a life if you've got naloxone on hand. So I want to finish. Uh, I want to finish because I want to save time for questions. I want to reiterate that now more than ever, all sectors are looking for ways to curb this epidemic. Businesses, faith-based organizations, colleges and universities, everyone wants to work together. So take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, you all just had the Super Bowl here in Atlanta. So I'm going to finish with a football uh, analogy. I'm going to challenge you all to be the quarterbacks in your communities. Uh, and that starts with having the right players on the field. Leverage your platform to gather together different groups and bring them into your huddle. College campuses are great melting pots and hubs to meet individuals you typically wouldn't have an opportunity to meet with. So utilize the common areas and workspaces available to you as students to have discussions about some of these topics that are taking place in our community, including the opioid epidemic. Meet with local law enforcement, faith leaders, and businesses to discuss options for your community that can make it safer and healthier, like organizing a prescription drug drop-off box in a local business or hosting a naloxone training. Reach out to the local Department of Health and say, we want to do a naloxone training on our campus and we want to make naloxone available. How can we do that so that we can make our campus and our community a safer place and so that all of our students can be in a position to be first responders? Second, throw a pass to your teammates. Does that mean I'm done? You all cutting me off? <laughs> all right, I'm, getting sh I'm shutting it down. I'm shutting it down right now. But uh, throw a pass to your teammates. Share success stories and best practices with other students and with faculty. And if you know someone suffering from addiction, please be mindful of your interactions with them. That relationship, that connection, particularly for someone who may be in their lowest spot, is powerful. You can help save a life. You can play a role. You can be that bridge to care. You can be that warm handoff or that connection from them so that they can continue on a pathway to recovery. And then lastly, when the game isn't going the way you want, have the courage to change the playbook. We need to have a conversation across communities about what it means to have an addiction, about increasing access to evidence-based treatments because there's stigma against medication-assisted treatment out there. And we need to support the expanded use of naloxone, which does not enable drug use, but it does enable recovery. So if we do all that, then we together can put ourselves on the pathway to healthier communities. And as members of the college community, one of the things folks will tell you all the time is, you're the leaders of tomorrow. I, it's just something that, that I don't like saying. You're not the leaders of tomorrow. You're the leaders of today. 
You're the leaders of right now. And I, I implore you, don't wait. Don't wait to start stepping up into some of those leadership roles. You have the ability to convey that addiction is a chronic disease and not a moral failing. And you have the ability to be game changers and disruptors. And I know you are because, gosh, US News and World Report said you are the most innovative college campus out there. But it's only through better partnerships. And that starts with being better partners that we'll all achieve our goal of better health for all. So thank you again so much for the opportunity to speak to you during Black History Month, to come to this wonderful campus, to have such a attentive audience. And again, I'm happy to take questions for, uh, for a bit if there's still time.